Could you eat your own mother? Would you let your friends eat your sister? Can you afford to pay the mental cost of what it took to survive in the movie, Society of the Snow? And more importantly, would you be able to live with yourself afterwards? This was the reality for Nando Parado, a survivor whose mother, sister, and best friend died as a result of a plane crash in the Andes. First, spoiler alert. Survival in this movie isn't just about the physical will to live. It's a deep dive into the human psyche, where morality, instinct, and sheer willpower collide. Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, also known as the Miracle of the Andes, was a chartered flight carrying 45 people, including a rugby team, their friends, and family from Montevideo, Uruguay, to Santiago, Chile. On October 13, 1972, due to navigational errors, the plane crashed into the Andes Mountains. This tragic accident led to a 72-day ordeal for the survivors. Pedro Algorda, one of the survivors, said, of the 40 passengers and five crew who took off on the fateful Uruguay flight to Chile, only 16 survived after the plane crash, an avalanche and hypothermia. At the time of the crash, the co-pilot was in control and descended prematurely, leading to the aircraft striking a mountain ridge, causing severe damage and leading to the immediate death of some passengers and crew. With limited supplies and no hope of rescue, the survivors were forced to make unimaginable decisions to stay alive, including the consumption of the bodies of deceased passengers. Algorda says, that was a decision that was taken not with our minds. It's not like an authority figure came and said, hey guys, I know what you have to do. It was a decision that was taken with our stomachs. They dried the meat from the bodies in the sun to make it easier to eat. At first, they were so disgusted by the experience that they could only eat skin, muscle, and fat. But in the end, they also ate hearts, lungs, and even brains. The ordeal received significant media attention, especially after it was revealed that the survivors had resorted to cannibalism to survive. Despite initial backlash, the survivors were later understood and respected for their desperate measures to survive. But what does it take to make such a choice, and at what cost? Can there be healing after choosing life over death in such extreme conditions? How do you handle the inevitable questions? Cannibalism, a taboo across cultures, becomes a stark reality in survival situations. It's not about a loss of morality, but a primal instinct to survive. How does this align with our understanding of human nature? Anthropological insights into cannibalism reveal its diverse motivations and contexts, stretching from ritualistic practices tied to cultural traditions and beliefs to desperate measures in times of extreme scarcity. Cultural and social factors heavily influence the acceptance and practices of cannibalism, with some societies integrating it into their religious rituals or viewing it as a means of sustaining community ties through symbolic acts of consuming the deceased. But obviously, that's not what happened in the Andes crash. The mental fortitude it takes to actually stomach this is immense. Roberto Canessa, a medical student at the time of the crash, told National Geographic in 2016, we had to eat these dead bodies and that was it. The flesh had protein and fat, which we needed, like cow meat. I was also used to medical procedures, so it was easier for me to make the first cut. The decision to accept it intellectually is only one step though. The next step is to actually do it. And that was very tough. Your mouth doesn't want to open because you feel so miserable and sad about what you have to do. My main issue was that I was invading the privacy of my friends, raping their dignity by invading their bodies. But then I thought, if I were killed, I would feel proud that my body could be used for others to survive. I feel that I shared a piece of my friends, not only materially but spiritually, because their will to live was transmitted to us through their flesh. We made a pact that, if we died, we would be happy to put our bodies to the service of the rest of the team. In this crazy way, these guys were lucky to have each other. Not only were their bodies literal life givers, but the mates that were still alive were mental life givers. By recalibrating their acts as contributing to the greater good, they were able to somewhat wash themselves of the guilt. Brotherhood is what saved these guys. In a group scenario like this one, unity and support are critical to survival both mentally and physically. Imagine if factions splintered the group and disagreements turned into competition rather than coordination. 
Strong leadership, which was already built in due to them being a team, contributed to the cohesion and cooperation that ended up saving them. In this one way, these guys were fortunate. They had each other. The psychological effects of cannibalization and isolation didn't compound onto an already terrible situation. They had a built-in support network, one that likely saved them from prolonged guilt and depression once they were rescued and rejoined the real world. Survival cannibalists experience profound psychological effects, including PTSD, guilt, depression, and anxiety. The stigma and societal reactions can exacerbate feelings of isolation and shame. PTSD can manifest through flashbacks, severe anxiety, and uncontrollable thoughts about the traumatic event. Guilt, particularly survivor's guilt, can overwhelm individuals, making them question their actions and the fairness of their survival. Depression and anxiety are common, as survivors struggle with the emotional aftermath and societal judgment. The stigma attached to their survival methods can lead to isolation, exacerbating feelings of shame and preventing them from seeking help. Imagine trying to live your life afterwards, your day-to-day -day filled with internal conflict and external isolation. Internally, you grapple with guilt and constant flashbacks to the traumatic event, questioning your moral integrity and humanity. Externally, you face avoidance and judgment from society with whispers and stares marking your every public appearance. Attempts at normal interactions are met with discomfort or outright rejection, leading to profound loneliness. This dual struggle of seeking self-forgiveness while also yearning for societal acceptance paints a complex emotional landscape of despair, isolation, and a desperate wish for understanding. So how did these survivors navigate things after they made it through hell? First, they had to break the terrible news of what happened to their immediate circle. Returning to Uruguay was not easy. The survivors also had to explain to society, and in particular to the parents and relatives of their dead friends, what had really happened up on the mountain. Can you even imagine breaking that news? When the news initially spread that there were survivors, the hopes of relatives and friends were reborn. When the list of survivors was released, families were either elated or heartbroken all over again. This divisional line of feelings opened a breach among them, which deepened when the survivors confirmed that they had fed themselves with the bodies of the dead, a subject that was presented in its real depth upon the return of the group to Montevideo. Second, society judged. The survivors initially told the media they survived on cheese and other food they had brought, along with local plants, planning to share the true nature of their survival, including cannibalism, privately with their families first. There was an initial backlash to the survivors' candid explanations of the cannibalism that ensued as a means of survival, which even sparked suspicions that the survivors had made up parts of their story, such as the avalanches, or were concealing that they killed other passengers, misinformation about them. Killing for food circulated, a priest confirmed their actions under extreme conditions weren't sinful. All of the passengers were Roman Catholic. Some feared eating human flesh would lead to eternal damnation. Some survivors compared their cannibalism to the Eucharist, the conversion of bread and wine into the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Others cited John from the Bible to justify their cannibalism. No man hath greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Then the survivors of the plane crash created meaning out of their trauma. The survivors of the Andes flight disaster navigated life after their ordeal with remarkable resilience. Their path to healing involved confronting the trauma, sharing their story with the world, and finding ways to honor the memory of those who didn't survive. Some became motivational speakers, authors, and even medical professionals, using their experiences to inspire and help others. They demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to adapt and thrive, turning a tragic event into a source of strength and purpose. Roberto Canessa became a pediatric cardiologist and public speaker, detailing his experiences to inspire others. Nando Parado co-authored Miracle in the Andes, sharing his journey of survival and resilience. The survivors also established Fundacion Viven, aimed at preserving the legacy of the flight, supporting organ donation, and commemorating the victims and their ordeal through educational and inspirational initiatives. To this day, the remaining survivors reunite each year on December 22nd, the anniversary of their rescue, and maintain a brotherhood of sorts, 
Some screened this movie when it came out and described it as the most realistic depiction of the hell they faced. After people see this film, they will really understand what we went through, Parado told the director. He said, even my wife, when the movie finished, she grabbed my arm, she said, I didn't know it was so hard. The mental cost of survival can never be recouped. A part of your soul will always be lost, and for those who can't manage it, perhaps the best move is to die early on the mountain. But as evidenced by the poor souls of Flight 571, it is indeed possible to move on and forge a life after living through hell that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Al Gorda himself has made peace with the trauma, explaining cannibalism as plainly and matter of fact as eating a slice of bread if you were hungry and facing death. The saga of Society of the Snow and similar historical events challenge us to consider what we would do in the face of unimaginable choices. They remind us of the incredible strength and resilience inherent in all of us, inspiring us to confront our deepest fears with courage. This film is a brutal yet beautiful mirror. It forces you to confront your own limits, to stare into the abyss of despair, and to ask yourself, what would I do to survive? If you like this video, hit subscribe and visit the channel to 